Welcome everyone. It's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you back to our Tuesday webinars here at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. I am Fran Hagopian and I co-chair this webinar with my colleagues Steve Levitsky and Alicia Holland. Steve is our comandante at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. Um, he, he prefers that title, but it's also very in keeping with the theme of this panel. Steve, do you want to say hi? Always watching out for coups. How's everybody? And Alicia Holland. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to, before anything else, um, thank the Dr. Class staff who by this magic behind the scenes make these wonderful webinars possible that has enabled us to bring so many voices um, to debate and to bring different perspectives to questions we thought this year during Zoom were particularly relevant for the entire region. Um, and we have a few themes this year and one of them is democracy on the line. And that's where this panel fits. Um, I also want to let you know that um, we have disabled the chat, um, but um, we do want to hear from you and you can put questions in the question and answer function on Zoom and we will collect those after the panelists have all spoken and we will try to um, pose as many of your questions as possible. Um, this webinar is being recorded and you can see it after the um, event on the Dr. Class YouTube channel. And Gabby, I think you're going to drop in the links as well as our calendar of events. Um, so this panel is entitled The Return of the Military Question Mark. And we were having a, a little bit of a discussion even before we went live about whether the military ever really went away or whether it's really back. And so I'm personally very looking forward to this. But, but mainly when we conceived of this webinar, we were talking about how for people of some of our generation, we thought that who are not experts on civil military relations that this problem had been solved. And as we've been thinking about democracy and the like, we've been thinking about civilians um, but we haven't, re we haven't really been thinking about the military until for some of us who, again, don't watch this as closely, it seemed like we started seeing more of military presence. We thought it was time to get a panel of experts here to address whether or not the military is back or whether it actually left or what it's doing. And we have an all-star panel. I know we say that often, but we really have an all-star panel today who are bringing expertise and perspectives from different generations and from different countries in the region. I'm going to introduce them very briefly. I'm not going to do justice to their lengthy vitas and their expertise in this area, but I'm going to introduce them very briefly um, so that I can give them more time to speak. Our first presentation will be by Wendy Hunter and Diego Vega. Wendy um, is known for all, across comparative Latin American politics and Brazilian politics and has been for decades. Um, she wrote some terrific books about the PT in Brazil, um, about uh, leftist governments in Latin America. She is working on undocumented um, nationals and statelessness and citizenship at the moment. Um, she's got a list of Cambridge books, but the reason we invited her was because her first blockbuster book was called Eroding Military Influence. And she wrote a terrific book about the Brazilian military and about why democracy would lead to the disappearance of the military. She's joined today by a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Austin, who is working with her. Um, and Diego is working on a range of issues, policy diffusion. Um, he is, um, he's worked as a journalist, he's Brazilian, he's worked as a journalist in Brazil. Um, he was, he coordinated one of the, the Brazilian team and the Panama Papers investigation. And they have joined forces to give us a presentation today about um, the return of the military question mark. Broadly comparative, but with Brazil in mind. 
They will be followed by Christina Mani, who was assistant, who was associate professor, excuse me, of politics at Oberlin College, where she also chairs the Latin American Studies program. She is an expert on younger, um, but she's an expert on Latin American regional security issues, civil military relations, the political economy of the military. And she, her, she did a big book about democratization and military transformation in Argentina and Chile. And she has um, a number of articles in all the right places. And she's also interested, interestingly, has produced papers in the policy world for organizations like Transparency International, the UNDP, uh, providing for peacekeeping and Rezdal. And so we're delighted to have uh, Christina with us today. Christina will be followed by the Dean of military, civil military relations in Latin America, David Pye on Berlin, who is professor of political science at UC California Riverside. He um, has written a number of books about the um, Latin American militaries, but two in recent years. One is Politicians and Civilians Reforming Civil Military Relations in Latin America that was co-authored with Rafael Martinez and also Military Missions in Democratic Latin America. Um, and I'm trying to keep these short, but I want to say that he's won two big awards. One is the 2019 Al Steppen Lifetime Achievement Award in Defense Public Security and Democracy by the Latin American Studies Association. When I told you we had experts here, I meant it. The other that I'm going to indulge myself to mention, because I think it's so important, is he received the University of California Riverside Dissertation Mentoring Award in 2016. When people produce this, this volume of scholarship, I always comfort myself by saying, yeah, but they probably don't really you know, do their, the other part of their job. To win a dissertation mentoring award is a really big deal. So I want to congratulate David on that. And our closer today is John Polga Hesimovich, who is assistant professor of comparative politics uh, in the political science department at the US Naval Academy. John's research is broadly focused on political institutions and democratic stability, policy making, and governance. And he's working on country lawmakers and countries with low capacity bureaucracies. He is specifically interested in patterns of coup d'etats and presidential impeachments. And um, we're really looking for, and he won an award too yesterday from his child who gave him the great dad award. And we think that's also really important. So I'm going to shut up and give our panelists about 10 minutes each. Uh, Wendy and, ha and uh, Diego only get five. And uh, Diego, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, let me see if I can share my screen here. Can, are you seeing that? Okay, uh, so this is a paper I'm working with Professor Hunter here uh, on populism and the military with the case of Brazil in particular focus, but we are trying to make it more general in understanding how populist leaders have build relationships with the military and why they need that and how that works. Um, so hopefully that will be useful and helpful to start this and start thinking about how these relationships can work. So the first question and the question we have here is, is the military back, right? Um, is the Brazilian military back in power? And everybody probably heard a little bit at least about Bolsonaro and how bad of a job he's doing about COVID. Um, he is a former military, he was a captain. He then became a congressman. Uh, he had a 30 years political career and he got, he became president um, two years ago after an election in which he defeated PT as one of the main political forces of the country. And one of the big things is he not only is a former military, he brought a lot of military people, of officers in to his cabinet and even in lower levels of the cabinet of the government structure. 
So our response to this, our first response to this is yes, they are back. Uh, the military now have much more political power that they, than they had in, in, in any government after the end of the military dictatorship. And this comes from the president being a former military. Of course, we can see that as something that matters. Uh, but they have, I think it, this was at the end of 2020, when I collected all the data about that, 10 ministers from the military, which is more than the dictatorship actually had. And these are the ministries that, are, that were controlled at the, by the military at the moment, in, in the end. The number actually grew throughout his first two years. And the most important thing here is that these first three, I mean, they are in a weird order apparently, but the first three of them are eminently political ministries, right? Uh, we could understand maybe the military in defense, in infrastructure, in mines and energies. These are roles that the military would be more technically connected to, but Casa Civil, Secretaria Geral da Presidencia, and Secretaria de Governo are three of the main political ministries that you can have in Brazil's cabinet. And they are also uh, military generals that are, that are controlling these ministries. So they are back. They have pol more political power than they ever had in the Brazilian democracy post 85. But there are limits in their power and these limits come from the interests that are related, that, it, that form this relationship. Uh, Brazil need Brazil. Bolsonaro needs the military, but the military don't want to be in charge in charge at the front. The main part of the institutionalists in active duty want to take a set uh, a back seat. They don't want a lot of involvement in in those areas that are more political, and they don't want to take the blame for those more problematic areas in which Bolsonaro is willing to put them. Okay, so we are thinking of this as a case of a populist government in relationship with the military, and in particular, a populist government that has no party support. Um, Bolsonaro throughout these two years had a very hard time dealing with Congress, um, mainly because he was elected in a party that was already a weak party. That party got a lot of people in Congress, but they very soon, big fight with each other, the party sort of dismantled. And on the other side, the military in Brazil is professional. So that professionalism puts the military in a position to restrain themselves into getting in this interventionism form. And they want to take get some political power, but they don't want to get the blame and be at the forefront of that process. So this whole thing comes from a populist dilemma we see when you have a populist leader come to power in a system that is still democratic. Uh, that is, they seek this unmediated and uninstitutionalized relationship with the masses. And they build that, and Bolsonaro built that a lot with evangelicals in particular, but also with a large online community of followers that supported him and they mobilized a lot during the elections and ultimately elected Bolsonaro who was a nobody in politics five years before, right? I mean, he was a, a, an unimportant congressman and he got elected by that direct connection with the masses. And the masses can put him, could put him in power, but they are unable to help him govern properly, right? Um, because he lacks that strong party support that lots of populist leaders have, he wasn't able to do what governments have to do in terms of passing laws, enacting policies, and even protect themselves from the opposition. This is a picture here of Bolsonaro with the Speaker of the House, Rodrigo Maia, who blocked his government quite a lot during these two years. And uh, Rodrigo Maia now lost uh, the position to someone who is said to be an ally of Bolsonaro. We are still to see how that's going to work. But throughout these first two years, Bolsonaro had a very hard time passing any law, enacting any policy because Congress was against him and he didn't have the support of a strong party that could negotiate and pass laws there. So with that, we move into how he solves the military, which Professor Hunter is going to talk about. 
Okay, so very briefly, I understand I'm down to four minutes. Okay, so what do the armed forces offer someone who has no institutionalized support elsewhere? They give him organizational cohesion and a professional image. The military exited from the military regime with a pretty high professional image. They also have a certain amount of technical knowledge and logistical capacity, and he has problems to solve. So they're an obvious... Um, go to place for some of these. Um, ultimately, I think we cannot ignore the fact that they can threaten violence or disciplined violence. That's ultimately where the military's um, um, sole uh, singular claim to fame comes from. So that's lurking in the background. Also, if you look at polls, um, long standing polls the military have very steady popularity among the Brazilian public and it cuts across class, it cuts across region, it cuts across income groups. And so this is um, another reason that the armed forces can offer him some support. Um, I, I also think it's important to mention that Bolsonaro is not an elite son. He did not go to a major university. He is not from an important family. He went to a military high school. He went to the military academy. Journalists have noted that at high official events with people like diplomats present, he is more comfortable talking to the security guards and to military officers. So this is a natural kind of elected affinity for him. Diego, can you go to the next screen? Okay, so what do the military see in their deal, in this deal? Um, okay, I want to also mention before I go to this, we need to, I think Bolsonaro has looked back at Fernando Kohler Gimelo, who ticked off the civilian elite in the Congress, didn't have a party, and he also pushed back the military. Where did that leave him? It left him with no safety net to fall back upon when charges of corruption came forth, and within two years, he was out. Um, okay, so what did the military see in the deal? They have recuperated some of their political status that they, from the time Kohler G. Mello started cutting back their prerogatives in 1990. They also see immunity from investigation about human rights violations under their dictatorship. You might recall that Jilma Rousseff um, raised a tr uh, truth commission, Comissão de Verdade. They reacted very strongly against this. And this is when I would date their um, resurgence of their interest in getting back involved in politics over. Um, they also are very anti-pechista. The main cleavage now is PT anti pechi And because, um, partly because of the Truth Commission. They have really turned against the PT. What Bolsonaro gives him is, is security or protection, a shield uh, against this. Um, and since he was associated with um, expansion of corporate resources and personal benefits, this was his sole claim um, as he was a backbencher for years in the Congress. Um, they see in the deal that they might get more of this if they can keep him in power. So this is about keeping him in power and keeping him from getting impeached, which has been um, always, or for a while, a threat. His sons are in trouble. Um, and so the part of the impeachment might involve his sons. Okay, but there are serious limitations to this alliance. I th we've looked at this carefully. There's no way around this. Bolsonaro needs the Congress. The Brazilian Congress is important. The military can be leveraged as a veto player, but it cannot help him pass and enact policies that he needs. There's also no way around the fact that he needs a party. He chose, he tried out seven th of them to um, run for president. He ultimately gravitated towards one that he left. He basically has no party. He's looking at an instit needing an institutional base for re-election. So uh, we also see that as a limitation if his main um, alliance is going to be with the military. And then interestingly, we see that the military don't want to be blamed. And this is mainly the active duty institutionalists. 
he has gotten the military to try to um, run the health ministry, something they don't particularly do. And apparently they don't do it well in the case of this appointment. Um, he recently appointed a general to head Petro Braš, which as you might know, has a share of problems. A lot of the institutionalists don't want the military's popularity hurt. They think if they stick to their own sphere of expertise, they're better off. Um, you can see that in recent weeks, the military support has declined. And uh, we think it's because they have gotten in over their heads and some of the mainline officers don't want this. They are internally divided. The other thing is um, the head of the army says pajama comrades, okay, men in pajamas, the retired the generals, you don't control the troops. I control the troops. I don't want the force politicized. So don't go kissing up to our populist president and you shouldn't be in these three highly political ministries. So I think there's restraint from both ends here. Punchline, this symbiotic populist military alliance has been fairly stable until now. However, in recent weeks, we have seen Bolsonaro try to negotiate craftily a coalition in Congress with what is known as the Centrao, a big group of center-right politicians, real classe politica kind of thing. We think we are already seeing that the military are taking a backseat as the um, tried and true ways of stabilizing a Brazilian co government come forth. However, our prediction would be that he will not fully push them back. I think given how fluid the situation is, he would be wise to, and I think he has seen this, keep them in his back pocket as a resource if need be. Thank you. Terrific. Um, great. Let's go right on to Christina, please. Hey, thank you, Fran and everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to zoom out uh, substantially from the previous presentation, which uh, really gives us a lot of granular, really interesting features. I'm going to speak in a bit more universal terms and raise some um, possible consequences of recent developments in the region that center on how the military has been used um, in the pandemic uh, mitigation pro uh, campaign, really. Um, and I want to uh, emphasize that this is really a universal moment. Uh, the pandemic is a great universal challenge. No country is immune and no single country can defeat this, uh, this plague single-handedly. It's also a great social science moment uh, where we can compare how societies are responding differently or similarly to deal with it. Um, in the case of Latin America generally, uh, COVID has deepened, I would suggest, uh, has deepened existing patterns in how the military relates to the state and society. Uh, the military never went back to the barracks fully. Uh, that is, uh, if we mean by that, to purely national defense roles anywhere. Um, uh, but it hasn't been used this extensively in Latin America really since the end, since the era of military rule. And because this is a massive all hands on deck crisis, that's not necessarily alarming. Um, but there are worrying signs. And as a first cut, the military has been reintroduced to two what I would call old roles uh, that we saw in the decades of populism of the 20th century and the 50s and 60s really sort of emerging as an institutional. Um, uh, 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 role uh, for the armed forces. And one of those is policing. Uh, so policing roles to keep order and in the contemporary moment uh, as an effort to uh, particularly to enforce uh, official quarantine policies, um, the lockdowns um, that in a number of cases, uh, Peru comes to mind, El Salvador. I mean, there, there are examples from across much of the reason, region and there are some exceptions. Um, Argentina, I think would stand out uh, significantly as an exceptional case. Um, but in a number of cases that you know, the military was deployed to uh, support police, but also to um, initiate uh, when needed uh, arrests uh, of, of the violators of um, uh, the quarantine uh, and uh, and literally in, in, in Peru and in some of the Central American countries, thousands of people had to be rounded up. Um, probably not the best thing in, in terms of mitigating the pandemic when you're going to be collecting people now and putting them all in together. 
Uh, that aside, um, the other main role that I would suggest is sort of making a comeback in this moment um, is uh, basic civic action roles. And that is to provide essential social welfare uh, um, benefits. Uh, in this case, um, engaging directly with populations for food distribution, water distribution, um, PPE uh, materials, uh, border controls um, in a number of countries, uh, repatriation in other countries of nationals who were abroad and had to be brought home. The military was the tool for that when the airlines were shut down. Um, also information provision. Uh, of, of basic safety protocols. And now as we're moving into past testing uh, for, the, for the virus, we're now moving into vaccine distribution. And so the armed forces have also, in a number of cases, brought uh, uh, their own facilities, uh, mobile hospital units, their own existing uh, brick and mortar uh, hospitals to serve this grand national task. Um, and all of this is possible because the military has a superior logistical capacity in many cases, in most cases, than the civilian institutions of the state. So with that in mind, let's recall some of the, maybe the lessons of the past. And one of these would be that the militarization of state agencies in the past often began with good intentions. Um, the advance uh, to advance economic development, uh, modernization uh, back in the, you know, in the 60s and, and really into the 70s. Uh, the idea that greater social equity and social mobility uh, is is uh, in the wheelhouse of the armed forces to advance that um, through civic action roles um, and also to provide greater political stability when needed. Um, however, these are all that don't inherently require the military's capacity. And I think that is a, the, the, sort of the underlying theme of what we're talking about today. Um, the military is being, however, called because civilian institutions simply can't manage this crisis. Uh, and that's certainly not unique to Latin America. Um, but the fact that the military is proving itself more versatile than the civilian sectors of the state is, I think, a ver is, a, is a, worrisome, a worrisome development. Um, if we connect that with, let's, you know, roll back to 2019 and the wave of protests that uh, rocked the region for a, really across the region um, that show deep dissatisfaction with the economic and political model of, of, uh, of our time. Um, and across the region, there's um, uh, combine that with the low rates of satisfaction with democracy and also support for democracy. We're at an all time low over the last decade. Um, and uh, in that context, civilians look better with a can do military supporting their efforts. Uh, and in a number of cases there, uh, it, it has raised the approval ratings. Um, if we look at you know, the pandemic, uh, the ratings at the, the beginning of the pandemic in let's say February or March and about five, six months into it, um, a number of leaders, uh, Piñera who was in the single digits, uh, had, you know, bumped his ratings up by about 15%. Um, Duque too, who was a bit stagnating, um, jumped by 30%. Uh, Vizcarra 35, there are other factors that also are involved certainly, um, but it, it has not hurt these leaders who have leaned on the armed forces um, as part of the as part of their uh, effort to contain this national crisis. Um, so yes, civilian leaders uh, issued the policies and, 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 and were the ones to bring the armed forces into these new um, obligations, um, but they also depend on the military in many instances now to maintain those policies. And I think that is the uncertainty. That's the uncertain moment that we're living in. Um, I think it's also important, uh, well, let me, I'm going to, jump down to um, another comment because I want to I, I address some, some possible predictions or things to think about. Um, but I think right now what's important is that there is a sense, uh, sort of a transactional sense that the military can be um, brought in but then put back, um, that there's an on off switch to the armed forces. And with societies panicked and uh, political leaders scrambling to respond to this ongoing crisis, and it will be ongoing because the economic consequences of it will persist. Uh, growth is not gonna rebound in a significant way in stability until the, until the pandemic ends. Um, and so, there, this is sort of one more immediate choice that needs to be made. Well, we rely on the sources, uh, the, the resources we have that are best suited to the military. Um, but it's imperative to recall what, that, uh, what bringing the military 
opt in to solve non-military problems can mean. It can mean expanding the institution's resources. It can mean expanding its formal and informal forms of influence in the state and society. And it can change the expectations about whose interests need to be protected and whose don't. And so that brings me to a few conclusions to think about. Um, these are really potential problems that I think uh, the region as a whole will need to be grappling with and perhaps the Biden administration also will be wanting to think about. Um, and, I, and so I think of this as really sort of a critical juncture, the, the arrival of this, uh, of this uh, pandemic, um, impacting both the nature of the state and its institutions and the military itself. And so with respect to the state, um, in a number of cases, and again, there are exceptions, um, the use of the military has the potential to reshape how states operate by making them more coercive. The military is now expected to be in, 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 in all aspects of basically saving society. And a number of our, um, armed forces are using the rhetoric of an invisible enemy um, and uh, in Peru and in Ecuador. Um, so, so terminology that really harks back to uh, an earlier era. Um, the growing surveillance and policing that's being used uh, essentially to manage and control social behavior uh, is has the potential to reinforce a more coercive state model. And in some of the worst instances in, in uh, Venezuela and in, in, in Nicaragua, for instance, um, uh, the COVID failures of the government are now a new reason to critique it. Um, and the security forces in Venezuela particularly have been used to crack down on individuals, on journalists, healthcare workers who are reporting uh, the critical facts. That was in a report by um, Human Rights Watch uh, back in August, I believe. Um, so that's one issue, more of course of state is possible. Um, second is by filling in for actions the civilian sector should be providing, there is less incentive for necessary reform. The military is taking away that obligation on civilians to make the public sector more effective. And so combine that with the economic exigencies and it is a recipe for continued deterioration of state institutions, unless there are new resources and new impetus to restore civilian elements of the state. Um, and finally, I think um, uh, it is also clear that uh, you know, the, the dependency on the military will grow, but also the military is, is taking lessons, is drawing its own lessons from its involvement in these missions. And they are already reflecting on, again, this language of invisible enemy being at war against uh, uh, this uh, persistent threat that one doesn't know the parameters of. Um, and I predict that this might be a, a likely uh, regular mission. Biosecurity is the language that um, uh, some of the armies in, in the region are now referring to as part of their, uh, part of their new um, uh, portfolio. Um, this is something that will likely need to build institutional capacity, so manpower, including reserves. Reserves are very, have been really useful for many countries. Um, budget uh, for training, for equipment, for new material, uh, for transportation, the ability to produce uh, ventilators and all kinds of medical equipment um, that's been provided by the defense sector in, in many countries. Um, all of which means that more not less development of the military institution is likely at a time when economies are in a free fall. And that is something, essentially something is gonna have to give. And it seems unlikely as my final word that it will have to be the military. So thank you, uh, and I look forward to uh, critique. Perfect. Um, you put a lot on the table for us. Thank you very much. And now we want to turn to David. Hey. Okay. Can you see the screen? Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Ah, okay. So uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, <clears throat> this presentation is going to focus on one particular aspect of military involvement in the realm of public security. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to make sure that these uh, slides are, ah, there we go. So um, I don't disagree that the military is active on many fronts today. I think that's uh, not without question. Um, but um, uh, my co-author and I have focused on public security and the military responses to governments that are asking the military 
to intervene, um, whether it be crime control or suppression of public protests. And uh, well, the issue that's on all our minds is what harm does military intervention create? Create for citizens, create for the democracies. Public security is a particularly problematic realm um, because public security involves principally law enforcement. Public security is the realm of uh, crime prevention. It's the realm of, of protest control. It's the realm of law enforcement, attorney generals. It's the realm of courts. Public security laws normally don't even mention the armed forces. So when the armed forces intervene, um, it, it's problematic because let's face it, soldiers make lousy cops. Of course, in Latin America, cops make lousy cops as well. That's a different story, but soldiers make really bad cops. They're not trained for it. Um, they're trained to apply maximum force. Uh, they don't understand um, um, basically UN rules of police conduct having to do with proportional force, graduated force, using restraint. The chances for human rights violations are real. Um, so uh, the question is that if a president orders the military to quell a protest, and they do so because they have political reasons to do so, <clears throat> um, what happens? What happens if a president, for example, tells the military, go in, uh, unrestrained, just get the job done, end the protests? <clears throat> well, there are two concerns that the militaries have. Um, and one is avoiding human rights abuses, and the other is submitting to civilian authority. Um, these are two really important imperatives. Uh, if soldiers are sent to the front line of a protest, for example, and there are clashes with civilians, the chances are people are going to get hurt, um, and they can be judicially exposed. At the same time, they want to um, abide by civilian authority because civilian control is 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 an important imperative in any democracy. So the risks are jud judicial liability and insubordination for the military. And the interesting thing here is what happens when those two imperatives collide? What happens when in the effort to um, uh, avoid uh, judicial liability, soldiers have to be insubordinate? Or what happens when soldiers want to be subordinate, but in the end, they expose themselves to human rights? Uh, charges of human rights violations. And those are the issues that we deal with in this study. And I think that human rights and civilian control are kind of interesting ways to frame what we're talking about, and also as a first cut to what we're doing. So uh, we conceive this in, <clears throat> as a typology. You think about military compliance with government orders, either being high or low, military aversion to violating human rights being either high or low. Uh, obviously, the best scenario is when a democratic government orders the military garrisoned and uses an alternative security force to suppress a protest, one that's well trained. Um, if you're saying to yourself, well, that's very uncommon in Latin America, you would be right. <laughs> that is uncommon. But think about Argentina in the past where the government used a gendarmeria to suppress, um, um, well, to control or suppress urban protests, the military stayed garrisoned. Uh, going to the fourth quadrant is, is the worst case scenario. And this is more of a throwback to the past where the military enjoyed high degrees of autonomy. Uh, and we're not concerned about human rights violations. And we're not concerned about civilian control and went in uh, to suppress dissidents with predictably disastrous results. Quadrants two and three are really interesting and um, kind of get us into the next phase of our research here. These are where trade-offs have to be made. So in the, in the second quadrant um, is the scenarios where the military is strategically defying civilian orders to suppress uh, because they're worried about, um, about human rights violations. Uh, and, and, and in order to avoid those collisions, they have to uh, somehow either go completely against presidential orders or they have to sort of reinterpret what those orders are. The results are that human rights abuses are reduced. Um, and the third quadrant um, here, the soldiers are, are paying more attention to civilian control. They're, they're remaining subordinate, they're following presidential orders. Um, they have less worry about human rights violations and then therefore, um, predictably, human rights abuses are higher. 
Um, so we're going to uh, focus on quadrants two and three mainly, and a little bit on quadrant one, um, and show you that, in fact, uh, there are a variety of military responses when presidents order militaries in. Uh, and obviously the typology only gets us at four outcomes. And so it can't tell us as much about scenarios in between the boxes, if you will. So let's move to the next phase. What we have is a study of six countries, seven cases. I'm not gonna go through all these because I'm lacking time. I'm gonna focus on Ecuador. Let me just briefly mention um, the others very briefly. Chile, 2019, you remember the massive protests against the hike in subway fares and against neoliberalism. The president, through his defense minister, ordered the military in, but the defense minister gave specific orders to the military to avoid physical clashes with the protesters. By and large, it wasn't perfect, but by and large, the military um, obeyed the, the commands and the human rights violations which occurred were overwhelmingly at the hands of the Carabineros. In fact, if you want to look into that, the National Institute for Human Rights has analyzed this, uh, the Chilean National Institute for Human Rights has analyzed this stuff and shows that it, it will give you the information about the fact that human rights abuses were principally at the hands of the Carabineros. Let me jump down to the bottom there. Another interesting case, Bolivia, military's non-compliance had to do with the protests over the electoral irregularities. Morales asked the troops to move in, the troops refused. <clears throat> and then interestingly enough, when the interim government came in and asked the military to move in, they did so, but that was under a special decree that gave them immunity from prosecution. Um, Brazil, I'm not gonna cover because Wendy has done that. And uh, Peru and El Salvador, are interesting cases of military shows of force. Uh, which have to do again with compliance with civilian orders where the military is put into an awkward position uh, where they siding with the executive branch against the legislative branch. Um, let me turn to Ecuador because this is a really perfect example of what um, I'm talking about when I say the military is hedging its bets. Uh, my co-author Igor Acaccio and I refer to this as conditional compliance. So in Ecuador, again, 2019 mass protests, this time in response to President Moreno's plans to end fuel subsidies and to enact an austerity program in order to get IMF credit. These were largely indigenous protests and there were calls for Moreno to resign. Moreno declared a state of exception, which made military intervention legal, called the military and the police in to quell the protests. No doubt Moreno had in mind potential power of these protests in the past that it helped to unseat three previous Ecuadorian presidents and thereby uh, moved temporarily government headquarters from Quito to Guayaquil. But he also wanted a firm response and his defense minister, Osvaldo Harin said, quote, acts of criminality or terrorism will be met with real force such as the armed forces can employ if necessary and reminded the demonstrators that they were dealing with, quote, a war fighting force, unquote. Okay, the military did deploy. And so in that sense, um, they are following presidential orders, but they adopted a more restrained response. One more in line with their own 2013 human rights protocols, which call for the use mostly of non-lethal weapons and restraint. Um, so, for example, they tended to guard the perimeter of the protest areas, um, guarding commercial property. They let the police go in to do the repression. They, <clears throat> they occasionally lobbed tear gas into the crowd. That's about as violent as they got. Uh, there were one or two clashes, and the military exhibited remarkable restraint to the point where a number of soldiers were actually captured by indigenous protesters, which gives you an idea that they might indeed have been non-lethal in their response. Um, and so this was a, what we call a tactical kind of deployment, a, a tactical uh, maneuver designed to fulfill perhaps the spirit of the presidential command, but not the letter. Um, so what's the possible motive? Avoiding prosecution. 
Judicial risks for soldiers had increased since 2008. There was a truth commission set up at that point that was investigating military and police abuses. There was a constitutional amendment in 2008 that said civilian courts could now hear military cases of human rights abuse. And interestingly, between 2008 and 2017, the cases of military human rights transgressions that got to civilian court, 33% uh, of those ended in convictions. That's very high by Ecuadorian standards. That's very high by Latin American regional standards. So how do we know that the military had this concern? Because we were able to see military official public statements to that effect, uh, saying that they were quite worried about potential lawsuits. The defense minister was really angered by these tactical choices and, <clears throat> and fired the commander in charge, General Javier Perez. Interestingly enough, there was no military pushback. Civilian control remained intact. In his outgoing speech, the military commander said he <clears throat> was proud that they had demonstrated maximum prudence and had they failed to do so, soldiers would quote, be recovering dead bodies. And that is not what we're here to do. And so I think that this is um, a good example of how the military placed in a difficult situation thinking both about civilian control and avoiding human rights abuses are able to modify the way in which they deploy um, to uh, protect themselves. This is all about institutional self-protection and individual career protection. I don't see any evidence that the military has been able to cash in on these interventions for political gain nor do I see any evidence that there was a loss of civilian control in this case in, in Ecuador. And I'd be happy to talk about some of the other cases in the Q&A. I know I'm running out of time, so let me leave it there. Thank you for that rich presentation, David, and thank you for accepting our impossible constraints. Um, now I would like to turn to our, uh, to our last speaker, who is John. Thank you very much, Fran. Thank you, Steve, for the invitation and Alicia. I'm happy to be here today. So as the last speaker, I think it's my job to uh, try to generate some debate uh, or, or push back against at least the title of the panel. And so I guess I'm gonna ask, is the military really, really back? Because I'm not sure that, that it ever left, right? Um, I study among other places Venezuela and, and Ecuador, and in those two places, <laughs> Venezuelans say, what do you mean is the military back? The military is, has been here for 20 years. Um, you know, it is alarming, I think, to see uh, the army occupying the, the legislature in El Salvador. It's alarming to see um, the military suggest that Eva Morales resign in Bolivia. It's alarming some of the, the things um, that Wendy and Diego described in, in Brazil. It's alarming maybe uh, things like that. But you know, Venezuela between 20, 2008 and 2016 had seven governors of, of 23 states that were mil ex-military officers. Between 2012 and 2016, that number went to 11. There are you know, members of the military in the upper ranks of, of the Venezuelan government and doing all sorts of ridiculous things, right? It, in Brazil, we can talk about the appointment of, of Joaquin Silva e Luna as president of the Itaipu hydroelectric dam, right? A, a general with no experience in the oil and gas industry, but that's reminiscent of, of you know, stuff that went on in Venezuela. The naming of General Manuel Quevedo as Minister of Petroleum and Vice President of PDVSA between 2017 and, and 2020. Uh, you know, the military has been omnipresent in Mexico and in Colombia. No one really has mentioned Mexico so far. Uh, engaged in anti-drug efforts and in the militarization of, of policing. So, you know, I under, in Brazil, yes, I think that people have reason to be concerned about uh, if the military is, is quote unquote returning. But across the region, I'm not sure that that really is the case, right? Hugo Chavez started this 20 years ago with, with the constitution of 1999 in, in that country. Um, you know, in Ecuador, the mil it was a military high command 
that helped negotiate transfers of power during uh, constitutional crises in 1997, 2000, and 2005, right? They were part of the negotiations making, again, like in, in Bolivia, suggestions to resolve political and social conflict, right? This is part of the reason in 1997 why the president of Congress, Fabian Alarcón, became president and not the, the vice president at the time, Rosalia Arteaga, because it was the military who negotiated Alarcón becoming president, right? Bucking the constitutional order. So I, I'm just, I'm not sure that, that, it, that it went anywhere. And even in places where the military seems or seemed less present, they have long been engaged in policy implementation and development, the way that Christina you know, highlighted. It's not just COVID. I, I think that COVID offers further opportunities for a militarized response. But this fits a broader pattern in Latin America that David, among other people, have, have, have written about, right? That militaries, and Christina as well, militaries in Latin America have organi organizational and logistical advantages that make them uh, kind of institutions of last resort for many governments, or in, in some cases, a first resort for those governments, right? To respond to health crises and natural disasters, right? And obviously, pandemics are emergencies. So, you know, leaders turn to these organizational resources, to, to logistics and to the security capabilities to make up for unreliable public agencies. Uh, and this is something that I need to publish, but that I show in my dissertation, which looks at military involvement in, in task implementation or policy implementation, right? I've documented thousands, literally thousands of cases of militaries cleaning up after hurricanes and earthquakes, building roads and public works projects, distributing vaccines and healthcare, and going so far as, as to, uh, to carry out literacy projects in rural areas, right? There's a reason that the Brazilian military has all its ridiculous ads, no offense to the Brazilian military, of, of Braço Forte, Mau Amiga, right? Like that's for, Diego is nodding. Diego, Diego is familiar with those ridiculous ads. I encourage everyone to Google Brazo Forte Malamiga, right? This is because the military continues to rank among the state's most capable institutions, right? And bureaucrats in many countries are unreliable task implementers. You know, amazingly, I'm going to share one, um, one chart with you. This is from data I gathered in Brazil of what's known as the DECI. The, the Department of, of Military Engineering, which is akin to maybe uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers in the United States. This is the budget of the DECI over time. And you'll notice what is the height of, of that unit's budget? When Joma Kusef, a leftist who was tortured under military dictatorship, was Lula da Silva's chief of staff, and then when she became president. This seems very counterintuitive, right? but she needed the military to get stuff done. We now know that it, there was a lot going on because of Lava Jato. We know why uh, public agencies as well as uh, private enterprises were, were so slow at getting things done. But she turned to the military in order to build ports, airports, roads, and finish stadiums prior to the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 Olympics. She needed the military, right? Venezuela did this beginning in 1999 with Plan Bolivar 2000, this massive project that spread, opened health, the military opened health clinics and literacy and provided transportation to people in slums and, and isolated, socially isolated urban areas of Venezuela after the 1999 uh, rains and massive mudslide that may have killed as many as 50,000 people. So, I, you know, where's the military gone? I, I think the military has long filled up spaces where the state is not present. It provides some stateness uh, in, in some countries. So, <clears throat> you know, maybe it's not, has the military returned, but maybe has the military returned to politics, right? Which is what we've kind of been talking about. And I think this implies something different for civilian control. 
Uh, and no one's mentioned new militarism, which is Ruti Amin's idea that, that the role of the military in politics is different than it was in the 60s and 70s, um, but still significant, right? She coined this term to refer to uh, the armed forces being allies, political allies of elected Latin American governments, right? This is different from new professionalism, from, from Stephen's idea of new professionalism, where the military takes over governance. Instead, you know, this is an old school military influence. This is uh, about what, what she said was keeping civilian elites in power or militarizing public security, looking at the Northern Triangle, Mexico, Brazil, et cetera, right? And I think I agree with maybe David and, and his co-author Igor, who say that this new militarism does not represent a return to the past. I think that I agree with that, right? Intervention is different. There have been only four coups in the past 25 years, depending on how you define coup. Ecuador 2000, Venezuela 2002, Honduras 2009, Bolivia 2019, right? And in all cases, the military immediately handed power back over to civilians. The military doesn't want to govern. It doesn't want that risk. This is certainly different from behavior we saw in the past, but the military is still there, right? Instead, it's, it's assuming a role in many cases as an arbiter of civilian conflict, but unwilling to take the reins of power. And we saw that with a wave of protests in 2019, all these pictures of, of presidents very solemnly looking at the camera, right? Remember Pepe Khan, remember Vizcarra, remember those guys in Peru when they showed up with, with members of the military behind them or Lenny Moreno in Ecuador with the high command behind him? Uh, and, and, and in other places across the region. So I was told to keep this very short. So I'm just gonna end on, on this note, which is uh, something that we've taken for granted, but no one's mentioned. And maybe for some people in the audience, this, this would, would be interesting. Um, I, make this, I made this for class, this chart, just to show uh, interstate war, what interstate war looks like. And you may say, huh, I can't see very much. That's right, because we take for granted that, that militaries do things in Latin America that they don't do in, um, in Europe and in the United States. And that's because there are very few external threats. Threats in Latin American states continue to be domestic, right? So, you know, to repeat a version of, of a question that both Wendy and David have been asking for, for a long time, you know, what should the role of, of Latin American militaries be in the post-Cold War world? And I'm not sure that, that, they, that they know uh, in many places, right? A couple of years ago, scholars, I'm almost ending, Fran, I promise. A couple of years ago, some scholars of Latin America foresaw a reverse third wave of democratization, right? They, they understood democratic erosion was occurring. I wonder what will, what will the 2020s look like for the role of Latin American militaries? Um, and to answer that question, I think it's important to, to recognize the diversity of states and diversity of military experiences uh, across the region, looking at consolidated democracies, right? The role of the military in Uruguay is, is gonna be different from the role of the military in El Salvador, right? Look at the consolidated democracies versus places, uh, states that are overwhelmed by security threats, right? Where the use of the military as an emergency reserve force is routine. And looking at places that are authoritarian as, as Christina has already pointed out, looking at Venezuela and Nicaragua and maybe El Salvador, where military roles are gonna be quite different. Now where Mexico fits and where Brazil fits and, and other places is, is up for debate. But I think that, it, that there needs to be some classification and not, not merely grouping uh, all countries together as one. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you all. I'm, I'm getting notices on my screen that my internet connection is unstable. If you can't hear me, please start waving and I will pass this on to Steve Levitsky to, to take us the rest of the way. I wanna just make a very brief um, comment and then um, I'm going to invite Alicia to ask the first round of questions. Then we'll give our panelists a chance to answer. Hopefully, we'll have a chance for two rounds. And Steve will ask the second round of questions. The observation that I want to um, uh, 
uh, make is this. First of all, I feel like I should offer a mea culpa. The, the question of the return of the military is really sort of a Southern cone kind of question, right? I mean, we sort of, the days of inviting Argentine naval officers to your chic Buenos Aires parties were over after the fiasco of the Malvinas and after the all the human rights investigations in the Southern cone. But you're all of course right that if we looked at other countries, the military never really went away. But there is something, it seems, gripping about this moment. And you've all brought into very clear relief, there's at least three separate issues going on. One are the security threats that some states face. The second is the COVID emergency that Christina put on the table. That this is a moment when the military's organizational capacity becomes just too important. And so for countries that have less state capacity, um, the military is going to uh, be handed a larger role. And there's a lot to talk about and what that means going forward. But the other issue is that of populism and of corruption and the Lava Jato, which has not, affected not just Brazil and not just Peru, but every place that Odebrecht operated in Latin America. And we see that even if some militaries like the Brazilian always have some support, we also know that civilians are losing support and there's more political polarization and there's more danger. And so this is why we have sort of, a, unfortunately, a perf maybe a perfect storm of COVID, larger role for the military in delivering health vaccines, um, maybe being asked to put down protests as David raised. So this is why it seemed that the topic was so important to raise now and your perspectives and your different country perspectives have been so important. Just a comment, I'm going to hand this to Alicia and then we'll give you a chance if you can answer questions quickly. I know I sound like a ogre here today, then we'll have a chance for a second round as well. But I want Alicia to at least pull in some of the audience questions and some of her own. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you for all the presentations. I'm going to try to ask one general question and then some more specific questions for each of the panelists. So the general question is, you know, when Nan Diego raised the issue that the military doesn't necessarily want things like the health profile, given the challenges of actually performing in these areas. On the other hand, Christina painted with a broad brush that the military is involved in two areas where performance is really hard, security provision, and then also sort of the basic civilian response, civil response during the pandemic. John put it somewhat differently that the military is um, called upon to, to provide presence where the state is absent. So has the military not wanted to step up in some areas, given the concerns about performance and professional image? Does the military actually want these portfolios and to govern in these tough areas? And how does it balance that against, against the challenges of actually, actually performing? So that's a general question. And now let me get a few more specific things. So there are a bunch of questions for Hunter and um, for Wendy and Diego. So the first was to ask, you know, how different is the contemporary coalition, sort of anti-corruption military business coalition behind Bolsonaro? Um, how does that compare to the 1960s O'Donnell coup coalition? And if so, what does that mean for the future of democracy in Brazil? Another question was to clarify how you see Bolsonaro actually helping the military in terms of um, crimes perpetuated during the dictatorship? You know, what, what can he actually do to maintain the lack of accountability? Um, Christina, I think a lot of people in the audience wanted to know more about variation in the region. So of all the countries, for instance, where militaries have expanded their roles and responsibilities during COVID, where do you think civilian leaders are gonna be most successful in pushing them back um, to pre-COVID realms after the pandemic subsides and where will they be least successful? Um, and also what is the sort of timeline that we should be looking for in terms of that process? Um, so then on to David. Um, so Ruth Diamond had some great questions. Um, 
that I want to pose to you. Um, one in particular was that, you know, it seems that you're considering in all these cases that presidential orders are, are legal and under the law. Um, and she asked, is it necessary to differentiate the orders under law and orders against law um, to measure compliance? Um, and she also asked, is there real civilian control in Peru and Ecuador? Um, and I'd add to that, you know, many governments, when they deploy the military, often are invoking emergency measures, but emergencies that extend for long periods of time. So in your typology, does it matter the extent to which the government complies with constitutional restrictions on the use of the military, and how much variation do we see on that dimension? And then one last question to throw out there for John, and obviously you guys should feel free to answer each other's questions, and one other piece of this you'd like is, you know, how much has military cha training changed in the region to prepare the military for this role as an arbiter that you see emerging? Is the military starting to receive more training in policing and protest management and emergency management? Um, if we looked at war colleges today, you know, how much have these military doctrines actually changed? So there's a round to start us off. Um, again, feel free just to take what you want and answer briefly so we hopefully can get on to a few more questions. And we can go in the order um, in which you originally presented. Um, so I, I let me take up the question of how is this different from the coup coalition. Uh, one thing we had wanted to say, but there wasn't time for, was uh, Bolsonaro does not have the technocracy on board with him. The coup coalition, the O'Donnell's coup coalition, was military, top economic elites, and technocracy. Bolsonaro just is not... He's not Fernando Henrique Cardozo. He's not Jose Serra. And he is uncomfortable with the technocracy. And they have absolutely no respect for him. So um, that's yet another potential institutional base he doesn't have. So he struck out with the Congress. He struck out with the technocracy. And he tried to cultivate Sergio Moro as the judiciary. But he cultivated an individual, not the institution. And that's why he went to the military. What can he do to um, shield the military from more trials? He can stay in power. This is about staying in power and blocking any um, potential resurgence of this issue. So Diego, did you have any? Um... Yeah, uh, just a couple of, of notes on, on to add to that. I mean, uh, the the Comparative to what Sergio Moro did in relation to the courts uh, would be Paulo Guedes, who is sort of a, an economist that could give the sense of a technocracy that could that planned to do a lot of pro-business types of, of reforms. Uh, and he's failing to do anything as well. So I guess the, the, the issue that is happening here in the in terms of what we could understand in this coalition is. He's unable to do anything for those groups that should be supporting him, and he's losing them. So he ends up only with those disorganized masses and the military as, as his backing. And then a little bit on the health part uh, of the more general question. I mean, I think the military in Brazil would be capable and willing to do a lot of these more logistical jobs without the political decisions without being involved in the political decisions and without being placed as the political main force deciding what happens there or not. The fact that Bolsonaro lost all the ministers of health he placed there until he was left only with the military to put there as a firefighter to solve the problem is what makes especially the active duty military uh, officers uh, concerned. So uh, that's how I would respond to that. So they would, the Navy would not be have a problem going up and down the Amazon vaccinating people. They just wouldn't want to make the decisions about um, the vaccination campaign. Okay, I guess that's that response yeah. to them. Great. I'll jump in quickly in the interest of time. Thank you for the questions. Um, I, I agree that it, on the one question of, um, you know, uh, 
to what extent the military wants a health profile, um, it's it's by strength of institution, and in the institutions vary in the region. Some have a defense industry capacity, so in Peru they're able to, uh, you know build and produce ventilators. Uh, that's a contribution. That's a different thing than a policing kind of role, of course. Um, but I think that the institutions have thought about what can we bring to this. Uh, the ask is from the, from the politicians in general terms, but then it's the, as always, the armed forces have to think about, well, what, what can we bring to the table? Um, so that varies in place to place. But the, the other question, um, uh, about you know the timeline and who will most likely be able to come out of this and go back to uh, the proverbial barracks and who will not. I think that um, the countries that that will uh, where militaries can be pushed back are the ones that have the strongest rules in place on uh, with civilian control and clear guidelines for the the roles uh, that militaries are. are are legally engaged in, and in you know, in Honduras is maybe on one spectrum where there are fifteen roles potentially, including protecting the environment, all kinds of things. Argentina's on the other side; they don't have that. They have the national defense portfolio and only operating uh, in as backup uh, in extreme emergencies for internal security and with a really limited. Uh, remit uh, with congressional oversight. So that's a totally different situation. And the military in Argentina has not been brought into the kinds of policing roles in the way that it has in, in other countries in generally, and particularly in the, in the pandemic. Um, so I think the best placed are Argentina and Chile because they have, they're the ones with, that have least moved into those internal roles. Um, on the other hand, uh, and I think also that to, to the extent that countries engage, uh, that militaries engage in human rights violations in the process of policing. And, and this is really important, um, there is civil society pushback, there is investigation, there is investigative journalism, there is the kind of journalism that you have in Colombia, uh, the, um, the, the kind of human rights organization mobilizations that you have in countries like Chile. Those are important checks. Uh, and that's going to matter. And that would be a reason to go to also not be participating in these kinds of roles. So we need to think about the societal component as well and the, the organizational capacity. And I think the hardest uh, to remove is gonna be in, across Central America. That is just where militaries have numerous roles and they are going to be busy uh, in whatever comes their way. Okay. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, yeah, David, go ahead. Yeah. So um, good question about legality, um, uh, especially because if the military are refusing to deploy and the order is illegal, they've got a really good case. Um, uh, in fact, back in Argentina in 2001, when De La Rua asked the military to intervene to, uh, to try to subdue uh, massive riots and protests, the military said, well, no, sorry, we can't. Uh, we've got a law of defense that prohibits us. If you want us to intervene, you'll have to have Congress enact a new law, which never happened, and so they never intervened. In the case of Ecuador, as is the case in many countries, um, presidents use states of emergency. Uh, and so Article 65 of the Ecuadorian Constitution allows for a state of exception, which allows presidents to call on the military and the police to intervene to restore public order. <clears throat> so in fact, it was legal. Um, same in Chile, where I believe a state of emergency was called. Um, Ec uh, El Salvador, uh, interesting case where, um, as you might recall, President Bukele uh, asked the military to um, come with him to the Congress uh, in an act of real intimidation to try to press the Congress to um, um, uh, uh, pass uh, to, uh, to approve a, a loan that he needed for security. That was, the Supreme Court ruled that as an unconstitutional act. And so that was a, I, I think a clear violation of the law. Uh, another interesting case is Bolivia um, where um, when Morales was tossed out and the interim president Añez came in, um, she faced massive protests against, against her and her administration uh, she wanted the military to intervene. The military said, we will need a decree authorizing that. And she did. She, she wrote a decree that essentially uh, immunized the military from prosecution. And interestingly enough, once they were immunized, the results were pretty predictable. People got killed. 
And eyewitnesses uh, who were there said that it wasn't just the police, there were military officers involved in the shooting as well. Uh, so it varies, but the case that I had spent time on, uh, uh, namely Ecuador, was a case where uh, the military intervened legally, at least based on state of exception um, uh, rules under the Constitution. Great. John. Yes. So, um, Alicia, you asked, you know, has the military's training changed? And I think the answer is yes, but maybe in a different way than, than the question intended, or maybe I'm misinterpreting the question. I know from at least a number of South American cases that there is now training for human rights, which did not previously exist. And in some respect, this would speak to what David uh, was, was just presenting. Where, you know, and I think Colombia is an example of that. And you can ask how effective this has been given the recent news about uh, abuses in Colombia, human rights abuses uh, under the Alvaro Uribe administration, the, the falso positivo cases. Um, nonetheless, that is, that is now kind of part and parcel of, of military training in a number of places in South America. I'm, I am not familiar with uh, training in Central America. Uh, and, you know, to answer something else, uh, Daira Arana asked in, in, in the Q&A, why civilian governments use the military in aspects outside, outside of security? And I just wanted to answer that really quickly, if I can have one more minute. Um, what, what I have found through my own research is that they're largely driven, civilian politicians driven by uh, agency capacity and ideology. So they wanna seek higher capacity, the perceived capacity of implementing projects is greater for the military than it would be for the equivalent civilian uh, agency, right? In, in terms of getting things done. And the second bit has to do with, you know, what we can see in, in Venezuela with Chavez and Maduro and what we can see with Bolsonaro with a really wonderful anecdote earlier of, of Bolsonaro feeling kind of more comfortable with security guards and, and things like that, which is ideologically, they, they feel a, kind of a kinship to the military and they feel that the military will just do a better job aside from their perceptions of, of capacity. There, there's an ideological um, affinity there. So those are kind of the, the two big reasons that drive delegation to militaries instead of civilian agencies. Great. And we're gonna get in a lightning round and I'm going to turn to Steve to pose the questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'll push back a little bit on, on John's provocative last claim. Uh, yeah, this is not, this may be business as usual in Ecuador or Guatemala, a handful of places, but this is clearly not business as usual in Brazil. What we saw in the last two years in El Salvador is not business as usual in El Salvador. What we're seeing in Mexico, and this is actually one of my questions, is clearly something entirely new. Um, so it, it varies a lot by case, but there are clearly some very important countries, beginning with Brazil, which we're, we were talking about a significant and I think uh, frightening change. Um, and I think it, it, this, this may not be a return to the past of the 60s and 70s, but I think this looks a lot like a return to the past of, say, the 1950s, where the military played a sort of moderating role. Anyway, to, to relay a couple of questions. One is uh, a couple of people asked for comment on Mexico. I know none of you were are primarily Mexico specialists, but there's been a, a pretty dramatic expansion of the role of the military in Mexico. AMLO initially promised to send the military back to the barracks. He's done almost exactly the opposite. And we see the military on the border. We see the military in, in COVID vaccination. We see the military putting down protests. We see the military in mega projects. Um, can you say anything about Mexico? Um, secondly, question, um, I guess this is for Wendy and Diego, which is asking for clarification on what it means to, that, that the military seeks to keep Bolsonaro in power. And push, push that a little further, might the military play a veto role in keeping the PT from coming to, back to power? I know that is pure speculation. And finally, just circling back to this question of why civilian governments are mobilizing the military, which John very nicely answered, there was a, a question that a couple of people asked, well, what exactly are the risks of that? Are we sure that that is costly for democracy or, or not? So uh, we've got to be fairly quick if you could each take a, a minute or two max and, and 
grab the ones that, that you see fit to uh, answer. Uh, can I uh, take Mexico? Please. <laughs> okay. So um, it, no question the military has been um, involved in public security for quite some time. This goes back many decades, but um, really ominously since 2006 in Felipe Calderon. Uh, what's interesting about this is that public security, if you look at the law of public security, um, there's barely any mention of the military at all. And that makes sense because, as I said previously, public security is not the realm of the armed forces. It's the realm of the police, uh, the public prosecutor, and the courts. But what's interesting is that <clears throat> AMLO has kind of sneaked the military through the back door through the National Guard. The National Guard is considered a um, legitimate tool of public security and has been thoroughly populated by military personnel um, that have been, quote unquote, on, on loan from the armed forces. Uh, and so the National Guard, uh, which uh, is involved in, well, supposed to be involved in counter cartel uh, operations, uh, is a legitimate, well, legally a public security organization, but they are overridden with military personnel. And, and that is problematic because the military has been using soldiers as cops and now they have a kind of legal authorization because the National Guard was created by an amendment to the constitution in 2019. So it has that kind of weight behind it. I just thought that was an interesting take on Mexico. Great. We're um, really out of time, but we need to give Wendy and Diego a chance to answer the Brazil specific questions. And then if you could do so very quickly, and then I will invite the other panelists, if you would like to answer any of the other general questions that Steve raised to please chime in. But let me at least first turn to the Brazilian presentation. You are muted, Wendy. So what Steve is referring to, I assume, is the kind of poder moderador model, okay, the moderating power. They're the guard where else when the presidents can't be trusted. I hate to say this, but uh, reasonable people in Brazil trust the military more than they do their unhinged president. And um, I think that's why they're thinking, okay, they may not be great, but they're better than him. And in a couple of key moments, they have pulled him back from utter craziness. So uh, they may not be doing away with him and calling a new election, but they are, they are a certain moderating power which gets them support. Um, I think the PT may be just self-destructing on its own. I'm not sure they need the military to do them in. And if you know anything about the municipal elections that were held in October, um, you might actually agree with me. Um, Diego, you know more about the daily impeachment issue. So do you want to speak about the what can they actually do to keep him in power? Yeah, I mean, I think a bit of that moderator, moderator power and that type of way in which they acted against PT even before Bolsonaro shows how, how they've been doing this. And it came out in an interview, a book that is an interview with a General recently that a, a tweet about the Supreme Court's ruling over uh, if Lula could be a candidate or not, I mean, this was the ultimate outcome of that decision, um, was not only a general tweeting from his home, it was a decision made by the army institutionally to play a political power, put, put themselves in a political position to say that. Uh, so I don't see them as doing a lot of veto power kind of directly, but they act as this, they keep this threat of the potential use of violence that could be used there. And I think that's how they, they keep Bolsonaro in power in, in many ways in reference to how the opposition in Congress have been able to block him over and over, but they are not moving against him completely because first he has that populist approval that is never going down below 30%, but also because ultimately the military is presenting themselves as the support base for, for his government. Even if I don't think they are willing to go all the way into using that violence and staging a coup, I think they, they are using that card over and over again. 
Okay. Um, John uh, said he wants to answer a question in 15 seconds. And then we're going to give Christina the last 15 seconds. It's just unfair to not be able to respond to, to Steve. Uh, yes, yes, I agree. The military is moving into new spaces in Brazil, El Salvador, and Mexico. Absolutely. I, I don't dispute that. I just think that from a comparative perspective, this isn't new for a bunch of places. Like a statement like that would cause a belly laugh in, in Venezuela, right? So that's all. Yeah, no, we clearly have different country and sub-regional differences here. Okay, great. Glad that got cleaned up, cleared up. And Christina. Okay, one more universalizing claim, and that is that the dangers of civil of civic action, I think the, the linchpin is that it makes the military indispensable in, in normal times, uh, both for political leaders who can say, ah, we have the resources, and for citizens the, in society who receive those benefits. And that makes them both uh, socially legitimate, increasingly uh, so as a piece of the state that matters most, um, harder to criticize. And therefore that makes them a useful ally, both for possible po civilian protests, uh, but also for political leaders. And we see that with the selfie image, the military doesn't have to do anything, it's in the photo. Um, and that is political power. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, we are truly at the end of our time uh, at Harvard University classes begin in three minutes. Um, and but I really want to thank, um, first of all, all our attendees today um, for joining us for this wonderful session. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank the panelists. This was just a terrific panel. I learned so much. You put so much out there for us to worry about and lose sleep about tonight. But that was your job. So thank you all. And next week, we have um, another wonderful panel, and it is about um, COVID and social welfare, challenges to social welfare. One of you said that until the pan that there will not be a lot of economic resources, and so governments won't perform that well, and the military will still be in the background. And so just um, you know, next week, we'll be talking about the challenges to social welfare systems in Latin America during COVID and after COVID. So I hope to see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Fran. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye -bye.